Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Sun. I'm a postdoc at Tel Aviv University. I work with Professor Tomer Valensky and Kafir Bloom. So today I'm going to talk about a recent work I did with my collaborators, Momo Bulenbad, a postdoc at Maryland, and Gigi Fan at Brown University. We know that axions, they were originally uh, proposed as the solution to the strong CP problem. But beyond the QCD axions, axion-like particles, they are naturalized states that appear in many UV theories, such as some string theories. Phenomenologically, they provide some interesting dark matter candidates that can be produced non-thermally. Because their mass can vary across many orders of magnitude, their existence can manifest very differently in the astral particle data. Just to name a few, these are some of my past work to discuss how to probe them when their mass falls into a certain range. Today, we are going to discuss the idea how to probe axions in the radio band. In particular, we make use of the phenomenon named stimulated decay and try to probe their decay product. So axon photon couplings, one of the well-studied axon couplings with the standard model. In astrophysical environments, they provide a very interesting lab that has a lot of unique features, such as there is a magnetic field at large scale, and there is a very long baseline for photons to propagate through. Today, uh, I'm going to combine some of the features, namely the high photon occupation number with the photon propagation line. And these two features, when combined together, they can cause the stimulated decay of the axon dark matter, which can be in turn probed by the radio telescopes. So let's look at something that we are all familiar with, the laser beam. In order for laser to work, we need a two-level atomic system. There is a finite transition rate going from the excited state to the ground state by, ex by emitting a photon. When there is an ambient photon bath whose energy is the same as the photon from this transition, the transition rate will be enhanced. And this is the Bose enhancement. But it doesn't have to be just a two-level atomic system. It could be some other two-level systems with a finite transition rate, for example, axons. We can view the axon decay as the transition from an excited state, here the axon state, to the photon state by emitting an extra photon. This process can be enhanced when there is an ambient photon bath with the right energy. Let's look at the conditions for this to happen. If we want the axons to be able to decay at rest, yet get both enhanced, we want the energy of the photon to be half, the, half of the axon rest mass. Next, because we want the Bose enhancement, which happens only if there is a large phase space density. In terms of the flux density, if we have a fixed flux density here, which is defined as the power per area per frequency, we want to look at the low energy end such that the phase space density is large. At the same time, we cannot look at arbitrarily low energy end because we want a reasonable astrophysical background put this together, it turns out that the uh, axon stimulated decay in the astrophysical environment is mostly relevant when the axon mass is around 10 to the minus 5 eV, which corresponds to a photon frequency around 1 gigahertz. Before I show you the uh, exact geometric setup, let's look at first the signal dependence. So the process we try to probe here is the axon decay stimulated by some ambient photons and the product we try to detect is the daughter photons from the decay. Here the signal depends on three components. One is the stimulating photon source, namely the brighter is the photon source that causes the stimulated decay, the bigger is our signal. The second component is the axon density, simply because the more axon we have, the bigger is the signal. And lastly, it depends on how strong the axons couple to photons. If we are able to model the astral component carefully, then we are able to say something interesting about the fundamental quantity, which is the coupling between the axon and the photons. So that is the plan for the rest of the talk. Now let's look at the geometric setup. Here, suppose that there is some axon with very low velocity, and there is a photon source some distance away from the axon. The photon source emits a bunch of photons, and these photons will pass by the axon. Here, that is the axon dark matter. There is a chance for the axons to be stimulated and decay. After the axon decay, two photons will be produced. One will be traveling together with the ambient photons that generate the stimulated decay in the first place. The other, in order to conserve momentum, will travel backward toward 
the photon source. And that is the echo signal we refer to. In the past, there have been studies about this forward going signal by looking into some very bright radio sources. There have also been proposals to probe this echo signal by using either some artificial photon beam or some very bright but constant radio source. So here, what's new is that we propose specific to the echo signal, the time of variation of the radio source matters a lot. In other words, the echo signal depends on the history of the radio source. Let's look at what are the benefits of looking into this echo signal. One is that the echo signal potentially has a lower background. The other is that it has a strong dependence on the history so that even if this radio source is no longer very bright today, if it was very bright sometime earlier, it can still contribute to a strong signal. In order to understand this, let's look at this specific setup. There is a source some distance away from us, and at some point in time, it emits a bunch of photons. Although a lot of sources we look into are continuous sources, here if we only look at a finite duration of the source, we can think of the emission as a pulse of photons. So now let's just look at a single pulse. When the source emits a pulse of photons, these photons go pass by some axion dark matter, and they cause the stimulated decay of the axion dark matter. After the decay, a bunch of forward-going signals will go along with the original photons that generate the stimulated decay, and they are together get probed by the radio telescope. And this is the forward-going signal. Immediately, you can see that there is no way to distinguish the signal from the background just by the definition of both enhancement. So therefore, there is always an irreducible background. And also, as I said, in order to have a larger signal, we need the bunch of photons that generate the stimulated decay to be large, to be bright. That means the source should look bright the moment the signal is detected. Now let's compare it with the echo signal. The same photon source emits a bunch of photons, and this pulse of photons pass by us before they enter, they encounter some dark matter, some axon dark matter. And they cause the axon dark matter to have a stimulated decay. After the decay, the echo photon, the photon propagating toward the source, will be captured by the radio telescope. You can see that the geometric setup is different, which is in, if there is a photon source in the sky, the signal comes from the opposite side of the sky. Therefore, if nothing is in the opposite side, in, in principle, this signal can have a very low background. And that is the first feature why we should, why looking into the echo signal is interesting. The second feature is that if we want to have a large signal, we want this bunch of photons to be bright. But this bunch of photons corresponds to only the brightness of the source when this bunch of photons pass by us, and that is a long time ago. It has not that much to do with the brightness when the signal arrives us. Therefore, even if the source looks already dim, today, when we detect the echo signal, it doesn't matter as long as, in history, the source was bright. And we identify that supernova remnants, they are one of such good candidates that were once very radio bright and that could contribute to a strong signal in this echo in this opposite direction. And this is the master formula we use. From this, you can see these three components I mentioned earlier. That is the flux density of the radio source, the axon dark matter density, and the um, decay wave, the axon uh, spontaneous decay wave, which contains the axon photon capsule. The integration really happens for the history of the radio source. That means that we are stacking up a bunch of images uh, produced by decay at different times. Okay. We have talked about the stimulated decay and why for the echo signal, the historical brightness of the radio source matters. Next, let's look at the supernova evolution because now we need to model the time evolution of the radio source. Then uh, I'll show you quickly how to convert the flux density to the signal to noise ratio that's detectable at SKA. In the end, I'll show you the results with some discussions. So this is the light curve for a supernova remnant. Right after the explosion, you can see that the luminosity rises up very quickly according to this empirical formula. And after some time, it transits to another phase that evolves as a single power law. 
The first phase is referred to the free expansion phase, and the second phase is referred to the adiabatic phase. There are more phases beyond these two, but we don't take into account of their contribution to the echo signal, since they have a very low luminosity. For the light curve, we have a few parameters, such as the slope of the second phase and what time it reaches a certain stage, such as when it reaches the peak luminosity, when it transits to the second phase, and the age, etc. Once we fix the shape of the light curve, all that's left to do is to anchor it with the normalization. We can either anchor it with the early luminosity, or we could anchor it with the late luminosity. Regarding these two ways to anchor the luminosity, we have some knowledge about each case. We have data for the young supernovae, so that we have some statistical understanding of when it reaches the peak and how high it is the peak of the luminosity. As for the late time data, we have the supernova remnant catalog, such as the green catalog, and also some other catalog, such as the SNR cat, where we have the information to anchor the light curve using the late data. Put them together, we know statistically how high the peak luminosity is and how quickly it reaches the peak. Now we have enough information to build up this flux time evolution, the, flux, the time evolution of the flux density, so that we can compute the strength of our echo signal. Now let's look at the detectability at SKA. Roughly speaking, we convert the echo flux density to the power of our signal. Then we compute the noise power by taking into account the temperature of the CMB, the atmospheric temperature, the galactic temperature, as well as the receiver temperature and spillover. Put this together, we get the averaged noise power of the whole telescope array. So this is a pipeline to show how we compute the signal power and the noise power. So let me show you some results. First, let's anchor the light curve with the late luminosity, which is the flux density here observed on Earth at 1 gigahertz. With this existing, this is one of the known supernova remnant with a measured location and angular size as well as distance and estimated age. So here, because the age has a fairly large uncertainty, we take the geometric mean as a benchmark. Put them together, we get this result. It has two curves, let me explain one by one. The first curve you see is the blue curve, that is, we extrapolate it back all the way until 200 years after the explosion. And we do not use anything before that. This way we could reduce the uncertainty, and essentially we only take into account the contribution from the second phase, the adiabatic phase expansion. But if we choose this 200 years as the transition time, and we extrap extrapolate it even further, we can reconstruct also the light curve for the first phase. Now we have a complete light curve, and we take into account the whole contribution, we get the orange curve. We can also make a few projections, such as with a hypothetical supernova remnant. And this one has the exact same property as uh, one of the supernovae we have observed in the catalog. But unfortunately, for the very specific supernova remnant, it locates in the wrong hemisphere, meaning that it locates in the southern hemisphere, echo signal appears in the northern hemisphere, so it cannot be observed by SKA. Here we take a hypothetical supernova remnant with exactly the same properties, but we change the location to a place where we can observe it. Now we get this curve. Again, in this plot, we only take into account the contribution from the second phase. These two curves here correspond to the single dish mode of the telescope, which is the uh, dashed curve, and the uh, interferometry mode, which is the solid curve. Those are the examples where we anchor the supernova remnant with the late luminosity, but we can also anchor it with an early data. For example, in this hypothetical supernova remnant, we assume their location, their size, and here I fix their peak luminosity to be within the two sigma range of all the supernova we have observed in the last few decades. And I fix this peak time to the mean value of the distribution. Now the flux today is a derived quantity. And we assume a distance as well as this age and slope of the second phase. And this is our result. In this example, I take into account the contribution from the first two phases. The solid curve is the interferometry mode 
while the dash curve is the single dish mode. Lastly, we check this benchmark to see how much it depends on the input parameters. We vary the peak luminosity, the peak time, as well as the transition time and its age and location. We get all the contours to show how much this, the signal depends on it. In particular, when we vary the peak luminosity and peak time, we get this, these contours and the uh, circle in the middle is the two signal range of the statistics from the statistics of young supernova explosions. As a bonus example, if we have a new supernova explosion near us with these parameters, then within 10 years, we can get this constraints from SKA. So just to summarize, axial stimulated decay provides us a very interesting way to enhance the signal that comes from the tiny coupling between axons and photons. In particular, if this stimulated decay is caused by some inhomogeneous radio source, there will be one photon traveling forward, another photon traveling backward toward the source, and that is our echo signal. We, uh, we argue that the historical source brightness matters a lot for this echo signal, and we identify supernova remnants as good candidates that were once bright in radio band, and they can contribute to strong echo signals. And we show that statistically normal supernova remnants can probe exon dark matter in interesting parameter range. And you're very welcome to play with the code. And if you have ideas, I'll be very happy to chat.